The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus was standing one day by the lake of Genezareth with the crowds pressing around him, listening to the word of God, when he caught sight of two boats close to the bank. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, it was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowd from the boat. When he was finishing speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and pay out your nets for a catch. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all night long and caught nothing. But if you say so, I will pay out the nets. And when they had done this, they netted such a huge number of fish that their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their companions in the other boats to come and help them. When these came, they filled the two boats to sinking point. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at the knees of Jesus saying, leave me Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were completely overcome by the catch they had made. So also with James, the son of John, the sons of Zebedee, who were Simon's partners. But Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, it is men you will catch. Then bringing their boats back to land, they left everything and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. When you read the call of the first apostles, it's really a stunning text. Luke gives us a lot more information than Matthew or Mark. In, in Mark, all you have is, and Jesus was walking along by the side of the lake. He saw two men there. He said, hey, come, come, follow me. They left the nets and they followed him. Well, thank God we have Luke. Because Luke tells us a lot more of what actually happened in the, in the background there. That it wasn't just a chance meeting. That this was not the first time that they encountered Jesus that in fact they'd had uh, an encounter with Jesus just before this. Because in Luke 4, we have Jesus going into Simon, Simon's mother-in-law to heal her. And we have the healing of Simon's mother-in-law. So before we have the call in Luke, we already have Jesus healing the mother-in-law, which would have been a very dramatic miracle for Simon and his whole household. And remember, after that healing, many, many people came to that house because they realized and they, they wanted Jesus to, to heal them also. So we, we start to have a picture now of Simon, not just casually fishing and a call comes and he goes, but as a man who has had an encounter with Christ already through the healing of his mother-in-law. But a, a, a man who is also a man of, of who is looking for the coming Messiah. Because if we take John's gospel now and, and, and transpose it on top of this, we know at the very beginning of John's gospel, Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist. He was a religious man. And, and as a disciple of John the Baptist, Andrew was looking for the deliverance of Israel and for the coming Messiah. And we know that as soon as Andrew was called, or as soon as John the Baptist said to Andrew, hey, there is the Lamb of God, Andrew followed him. And as soon as he encountered Jesus, the first thing Andrew did was he went to Simon Peter. He went to Simon, his brother, and said, we have found the Messiah. So the back story tells us a lot more than the one text tells us. But what, what we do know is that Simon was a religious man. 
he was somebody who was <clears throat> wrestling and grappling with, with the Messiah and expecting the Messiah to come. He, he, he was, and his brother and him, were certainly men of faith, <clears throat> men of devotion, and men of practice of the faith. And, and in that, now we, we have the text that we have here, where Simon, and, and you know, I love the character Simon Peter. I think he's one of the most colorful characters in the whole of the New Testament. Because he, he, he can get it so wrong, and he could get it so right. And, and his insights are so powerful. And yet his foolishness is so great. I, I, I take great consolation from this saint. Simon Peter is here in our text. The crowds are pressing in on Jesus. And, and pushing him, I imagine, to the waterline. And so he asks Simon Peter to get into his boat. Now, Simon doesn't let the master get in the boat and he don't get in also. Huh? Do mind he was fishing and, and mending his nets. He had finished fishing. He was now mending the nets and, and, and putting them away for tomorrow. He gets in the boat with, with, with Jesus. But it is important that the text tells us that Jesus got into Simon's boat. He got into Simon's boat and was teaching in Simon, from Simon's boat. And the, the, the early church father sees this as a, as a whole image. The bark of Peter, bark being an ancient word for boat. The bark of Peter being the source of teaching of, of the church. And the, and the church being uh, the boat that Peter is, is steering. And, and so the ancient church sees in, the, in this already the, the, the Jesus already knew what he was calling Peter to. And you wouldn't imagine it from the character of Peter, but Jesus already knew. So there in the boat, after Jesus finished preaching, he tells Simon Peter, you know what, why don't you take those nets you just spent a couple hours cleaning? Take those same nets, yeah, the ones you just spend a lot of time cleaning. Take those nets, bring it back into this boat. Pay out into the deep for, for a catch. You, you understand this, this story? Eh? It's, it's like, like you just finished cleaning your car and somebody tell you, hey, let's go down that muddy road right now. You're going with them? I just spend this time cleaning my car. You, wait, wait, what Jesus asked of Simon was something really difficult. Difficult on, on several levels. The first level is, is the work he had just finished doing in cleaning the nets. The second level is Jesus is a carpenter, he's not a fisherman. And Simon is a professional fisherman. You ever tell a professional tradesman how to do his trade and, and get a straight answer back from him? Eh? Ever? No, because what Simon is saying here, and it is very nice and coded, is that, Master, you really know what you're talking about, you know. Fish don't come during the day just so, you know. And if we couldn't catch them at night, why do you think we're going to catch them during the day? We've worked hard all night long and caught nothing. So all the human obstacles are there, all of them. The fact that Jesus is not a fisherman, the fact that, that fish, as everything that Simon knows, tells Simon that what Jesus is asking is foolishness. But the next part of it is why Simon is such, such a beautiful saint. He says, Master, if you say so, I will pay out my nets. And that, that, that is it. My human intellect tells me you are asking me to do stupidness. But Lord, if you say so, I will do it. Say that with me now. Lord, if you say so, I will do it. The bending of his heart to the will of Jesus, the obedience of Simon to the will of Jesus, is really the turning point in the story. 
the story of Simon, the story of the early church. It, it turns on this axis of obedience, of bending heart and will to the will of God. And, and it is right here on this axis of turning to the will of God that we have the deepest problem in the church today. The real challenge we have is, is not in all the scandals which are crazily bad. Or not in all of, the, all of the ways in which we have failed as church. All of the sinfulness of our people. Th those are terrible, terrible, terrible. But the greatest challenge we have is, is in the lack of, of capacity to bend to God's will when God is asking us something. Prayer really brings us to this place of bending our heart to the will of God. That's, that's the whole point of prayer. And that's what we'll see here with Simon Peter. Simon says, if you say so, I will pay out my nets. And, and, and throws logic aside and goes to obedience to Jesus. And when they had done so, they netted such a huge number of fish that their nets began to tear. In John's gospel, we have this parallel text, but at the end, where, where Jesus remissions Peter, Peter after giving him a great catch of fish. And, and in that text in John, the nets did not tear. That, that then Jesus strengthened Peter such that the nets were able to contain all the fish that was, that was given to them. The fruitfulness of the, of the mission, the fruitfulness of the mission is the first point that, that really blows Peter's mind. But it is his obedience that allows the mission to be fruitful. It is the obedience of Peter that allows the mission to be fruitful. And when there is obedience to God, there is a fruitfulness of mission. When the mission is scant, and you are working hard all night and catching nothing, and things are difficult, that's a stage in the journey. But the fruitfulness that will come after that can only come if we are willing to be obedient to Jesus. Obedient to Jesus. When Peter experiences the fruitfulness of his mission in the multiplicity of, of fish that were caught to bring two boats to sinking point. Peter has no response at that stage. He is completely undone. He sinks to his knees and he says to Jesus, leave me Lord, I am a sinful man. Because Peter knows he comes face to face with God. He called Jesus master up above. Now he calls him Lord. And Lord, curious, would have been the name of God. That would be the name for God in the, in the, for a first century Jew. And so when Peter sinks to his knees and says, leave me Lord, he recognizes that he has come face to face with something that is so big that, that his little fragile ego cannot stand it anymore. That his ego can't hold in the face of all of this. And, and because he, he realizes what he's coming in, into face to face with, he, he himself is being undone. But that being undone is being done again by God. If you look at the first reading from Isaiah which also does a, a similar thing Isaiah was a he was a notary in the court the king had died and then God called him and all through Isaiah the name of God is holy, holy holy Lord God of hosts so for Isaiah God is the holy of the holy ones and all through Isaiah you have the sense of a God that is huge, that is big, 
Remember, the Romans had a little sense of God. Uh, uh, they, had, they walked around with their gods in their pockets in little figurines. And, and others had images of God that they could move around as they want. But, but Isaiah starts helping Israel to understand that God is not this little character that we can do with as we want and bring him where we want. God is the one who is so completely other that, that we can't even understand how to stand in the face of this God. And, and when Isaiah comes before the living God, he says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. His glory fills the whole earth. You have to see in this the, the sense of, of the bigness of this God that Isaiah has encountered. And, and because God is so huge, so big, his glory is filling the whole earth. Isaiah realizes what a wretched state I am in. I am lost. I'm a man of unclean lips living among a people of unclean lips. To come face to face with God is to recognize how, how sinful we are. To come face to face with God is to recognize how stupid and, and silly we are. To come face to face with God is to recognize that what we put so much time and energy doing is really so little and, and so unimportant. To come face to face with God is to, to realize that, that really and truly all, all of our ego battles that we fight and, and we spend so much energy doing and fighting these ego battles, that they're really naught. They're really naught before our God. And, and that's what Isaiah is experiencing. And, and that's, what, that's what Peter is experiencing. And that's what God wants every single one of us to experience. To come face to face with God. To experience that call that he gives to us in our life where, where we understand that, that we are really nothing at all, as Jeremiah would say, mere worm, puny might. Brothers and sisters, we become so arrogant and so, so filled and self-possessed and, and trying so hard to make something of ourselves that we've forgotten the most fundamental truth. That we don't make something of ourselves. We were made in the image and likeness of God. And God has made us into something that is his image and likeness. And, and that identity that God has given us up front is the truth of who we are. And the second truth is this. That when we live by our vocation, we become the best version of ourselves. And how do we live by our vocation? Well, like Peter, like Isaiah, by being obedient to God's call in our life. And, and when, how do we know our call? Well, every one of us was created for sacred purpose. Every one of us, from our mother's womb, God called us by name and set us aside for sacred purpose. And how do we know that sacred purpose? You, you prayerfully ask God to show you the sacred purpose of your life. Prayerfully you ask God to, to, to show you that what it is he created you for. And prayerfully say yes to him in whatever he asks of you. Prayerfully say yes to him. In whatever he asks of you. Many times we, we, we come face to face with God's purpose in our life. And we run. Eh? We just run. When, when I was 16 years old, I came face to face with God's purpose in my life. And, and for 15 minutes, I was dumbstruck, silly and foolish. Standing up, looking out of a window. And, and at the end... And, and, and it, what undid me was a simple question. What if I ask you to be a priest? Simple question. And after 15 minutes of just feeling like my whole insides were completely coming apart, I, I realized and I was convinced and I knew for sure. And I, I really had no hesitation in that knowledge either. That God could not ask me to be a priest. Yeah, it was real simple. No, no, I was sure. Eh? I didn't know. I didn't have a second doubt about it. Eh? God could not ask me. 
Why? Because I was dyslexic and I couldn't read in public. And, and there's no way a priest reads in public every day, there's no way I could do that. So there's no way that that could be from God. And then, and then of course, I had a girlfriend, but that was a little complication, I suppose. <laughs> and not being able to have my children and, and getting married was a, a, big, a, a bigger complication. And, and the, I made my weakness and my desires an obstacle to my vocation. And for five years, I never thought of priesthood, not even a momentary thought did I have for five years. So why did I not see the vocation when it first came? I was blinded by my weakness. And that's what Peter experienced. Lord, I am a sinful man. He was blinded by his weakness. And I was blinded by my desires. Your vocation is real. And, and our obstacle to the vocation is when we are blinded by our weaknesses and when we are blinded by our desires, when we are blinded by our sin sickness. And, and God deals with all of those. God deals with all of those. Do not be afraid to allow your life to be thrown into the hands of the living God. Do not be afraid. That's what he says to Simon here. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. It is terrifying. It is terrifying when we come face to face with God. It is terrifying when God asks us to do what he's calling us to do. It is terrifying when we have the encounter with God. That's what Isaiah and Peter experienced. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. To give God whatever God asks of you. Do not be afraid. At, at least we could agree that my powers of discernment at 16 were very bad. We could agree on that. Do not be afraid. Every one of us has a vocation. Every one of us. And to live that vocation is a way to find the, the deepest joy and happiness and to become the best you will ever become do not be afraid do not be afraid the thing that stops us most from living our, our vocation is fear and then weakness and then our desires and if we understand who God is if, if if we, if we understand that God is not the, this little, little guy that we do a to-do list for every day and quarrel with him because he ain't finished yesterday's task that we have given to him that, that, that he, he somehow slacking on the job. That is not God. Isaiah has God. Holy, holy, holy. Because his glory fills the whole, the whole earth. God is, God is this, this big, big character that, that we could never, ever begin to put our mind and our heart around. Because we ch keep trying to put God into the small box that we can contain. That is not God. Open your heart wide to the encounter with the living God. And allow God to take you wherever God wants you to go. Stop resisting God. Let him lead you. You cannot lead God and you cannot do for God what God needs done. It is God who created us in his image and likeness and it is God who makes our life fruitful. Open your heart wide to the living God and let God in today. And if today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts as are they of Maribor in the desert when your fathers put me to the test. Open wide your hearts to the living God. God wants something with your life. He wants something with your life. As he wants something with my life. Open your hearts wide. Amen.